Well, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Peter. I've come in from the University of Strathclyde uh, to talk to you. And the title of my presentation, as you can see, is Understanding Physical Changes and Strength Loss of E-Glass Fibres Following Exposure to Elevated Temperatures. It's a little a bit of a mouthful, I know. So, to introduce, glass fibre is an extremely important material in many manufacturing industries, possibly the three main ones being wind, automotive and marine due to excellent specific properties. So, and when I say glass fiber here, I'm talking about not like insulation fiber, I'm talking about mechanical reinforcement fiber, formed in a continuous fashion, with a diameter which is generally in the range somewhere between 10 and 25 microns. So, e extremely small, but not insulation style. Um, so it has excellent specific strength and stiffness to ninjas too, which are probably the most important from an engineering point of view. 90% of all of the fibre used in any fibre reinforced composite materials worldwide is glass fibre. You hear a lot about carbon, awful lot more about carbon than it perhaps merits based on the fact that it makes up less than 10% along with a few other kind of low production volume. It's, it's mostly about glass worldwide and it equates to something like 7 million tonnes at this point per annum. Um, and more than half of this, so some of it's going into thermoplastics, polypropylene, um, your kind of injection molded parts. And those are inherently somewhat recyclable because of thermoplastics. You can remould to an extent. But more than half go into thermal setting plastics or resins, epoxy, polyester, and such. And these are extremely challenging um, when it comes to recycling because of the cross linking and the, the very strong bonds that form with the fiber in that network, in that, in that matrix material. Separation is possible, but at a low estimate, it's it takes a temperature of at least 450 degrees and often a lot more to separate them. And the issue there is that that is extremely detrimental to the fibre strength. Fibres no longer have value you can, in, in, in any sense, whether it's monetary kind of value or engineering um, value, strength, or uh, particularly strength, because of um, this degradation of strength. And this kind of shows this, this figure here from a recent publication. It kind of shows the scale of the problem if you, if you see it as a problem, which I think considering the fact that you can't just keep chucking these things in the ground anymore, it's becoming um, essentially against the law and there are regulations more and more in place to prevent that. You need to find something to do with this waste material better than burying it and hope, trying to forget about it. So the top curve there shows um, global demand, which is, you can see, significantly increasing um, year on year, more or less, and then you have the three kind of lower. So the twenty year end of life is kind of an estimate. So extrapolating data from twenty years in the past in terms of production, taking that forward, and then we've got manufacturing waste from the actual manufacture of glass fiber itself, or GRP glass reinforced plastic, which also produces a certain amount of waste. And then you add all that up to that solid line. That's how much fiber, in theory, there's been that you could consider recoverable glass fiber, which from thermal sets only which you may be able to do something with, although up to this point it's basically been thrown away for the most part. So, let's talk about the strength loss effect. Um, in the literature it's extremely well established and a large amount of the work has been done on e-glass. So e-glass is just one formulation of glass fibre for mechanical reinforcement that is the most widely used because it has generally good properties without being particularly expensive. There are higher stiffness and higher strength fibres available but they're generally tailored to specialist applications, for example, a wind turbine blade, especially with the size that they're produced at today. But it's also been um, shown with other industrial important fibres, like these higher strength fibres, or even other formulations like basalt, which is used um, in, other, uh, in, other in other manufactured products. So the figure shows here that even with relatively modest um, conditioning temperatures, so in this case we're simulating a recycling process as a starting point to understand the strength loss, we see very significant strength loss. Um, and when you get to high temperature, 600 degrees or more, you might be talking 20% of what you had at the beginning. Now some of this can be um, attributed to mechanical damage. Glass is a brittle material, it's about the surface state, um, and any kind of scratching, it's less clear and less obvious because of the dimensions of these fibres, but they're still subject to the same, governed by the same laws. So sometimes it can be mechanical, um, and certainly in a recycling process that can be part of the problem. You can end up with 10% of the strength you started with, or even less. But it's been shown that there's a significant part of the strength loss which is related to thermally based mechanisms. When we remove these 
mechanical effects as far as it's possible to do so. There's still a very significant strength loss. So there's some mechanism or there's some mechanisms occurring that cause this. <coughs> so this time, the effect, see, is time and temperature dependent. Temperature, obviously, shown on the previous slide, but time dependent in that as you, if you leave this material at elevated temperature for a longer time, it tends to, the strength tends to drop until you reach a minimum value. And that drop is extremely quick at higher temperatures, so you'll, within half an hour or less, you will be at that minimum value. But it's time and temperature dependent, not dependent on the treatment atmosphere. So some studies have um, compared dry inert gases quite commonly with just atmospheric conditions, an air furnace, and it's been shown that there is no, um, no difference in the strength that you'll end up with. The only exception being um, if you're using a fiber, so generally for um, any kind of product you're going to put it in, you've got a sizing, a complex organic based material which is coats the fiber to protect it and to promote, promote um, strong bonding with the matrix material that you plan to use. So if that's in place, sometimes there's a, a, a slight effect in terms of whether you have oxidative or non-oxidative degradation of that coating. But for the purposes of the fundamental research which I'm, I've been working, we take that away or we, we use only a single component sizing or silane on the surface of the fibre or we use just bare fibre with, with no coating at all to try and understand the fundamentals of the strength loss. And lastly, um, a less well-known um, effect is that if you heat treat fibres under tensile stress, it's been shown that you in fact can retain more of the strength. Um, this is something I've listed a few references here. That's all there is. That, that's about all there is in terms of references in the literature on this effect. It's it's a strange thing. Um, it's just a strange effect in some ways, but it shows that some kind of mechanism, and these are kind of examples that have been taken from these papers. These the ideas about the flow of material as you hold it under stress at elevated temperature. Something happening around the flaws possibly changes the strength that you then get when you release that or you cool it and release that stress and then you can test the fibre to failure. So, something, so there's something interesting in there, although it's not fully understood quite yet. So let's talk about things that are understood relatively well, where we think we really have a good grasp on what's happening. So rather than to do with the strength, just other physical changes that happen when we heat these fibres. Enthalpy relaxation is the first one I talk about. So when fibres are formed, they are quenched extremely quickly, so could be up to 10 to the 6 degrees per second. It's it almost an instantaneous cooling as we pull it at high speed from a melt which is maintained at above 1200 degrees centigrade straight through a cooling spray in air. So there's a non-equilibrium -equil structure of the fiber, which um, we can quantify one way is effective temperature. But I won't really talk too much in detail about that. It's just a way that we can quantify um, this non-equilibrium structure of a fibre. And this uh, has also been described um, by you at all with, in terms of excess enthalpy in, in a number of papers they published. And what they've shown is if we reheat the fibres for sufficient time at some kind of elevated temperature, there's a release of enthalpy as they term it, which is within the fibre, so that the fibre relaxes this. And evidence of this same effect has been shown in a different way um, by other researchers and what they looked at was densification, so holding a single fibre uh, with a, just a slight load so that it's fully straight and then heating it we see that counterintuitively it actually shrinks with temperature. So there's a contraction in the length, that's easy enough to measure, a contraction in length is still only micrometers, a contraction in diameter is much more difficult to quantify, but it has been shown that it is in both directions. It's not simply a shrinkage. There's also a contraction in the diameter of the fibre, and that's been measured. And in addition, so when you take that fibre out to room temperature, there's an increase in Young's modulus. So we show the figures here. So this is um, H here showing enthalpy. It's a kind of index. So we have at one, we have the excess enthalpy that was in the fibre at the beginning. And as you increase the temperature, it is released and less of that excess enthalpy remains. Um, the scale is a bit difficult here because this is in terms of the glass transition and annealing temperatures used, but as a guide, 0 0.6, about 300 degrees centigrade, and the maximum data point there is something like 600 or 650 degrees. So it takes place over a range of temperatures, which is also interesting in terms of the recycling of fibres, 
um, in that, kind of, like I talked about, 450 up to 600 perhaps degrees centigrade. And similarly, if we then look at the uh, length contraction and modulus experiment that's done, it shows a figure here. So we have two curves. The one with the circles, which drops away, is the modulus of the fibre tested at that temperature, what's held at that temperature in a thermomechanical analyzer and tested. And the uh, squares represent the fibre tested and the modulus that's measured when it's then tested at room temperature following the, um, the heat treatment, the isothermal at various temperatures. So the fibre has, the structure has become denser, the fibre lengths contracted, we have a higher modulus, but we also have a lower strength. So modulus going up might be considered a, a good thing, but the fibre strength going down is the problem. Another property which um, relaxes is birefringence. So when fibres, as I was kind of speaking about before, fibres are pulled at very high speed from, um, through small uh, bushings from melt, and they're pulled, they have to be pulled with a certain stress, and this gives you a, so there's a one-dimensional anisotropy along the fibre longitudinal axis which forms from, from this pulling, and you can characterise this by measuring the birefringence, so the way that light and um, the refraction is different depending on the direction you pass light through a sample. Um, that's shown in this figure, which you've just seen in the previous slide, but the other curve here, so it's again an index there, and it shows that this property relaxes more quickly than the excess enthalpy. But again, it's a similar range of temperatures, we've seen this relaxing. So, in terms of relation between these things that I've kind of said we understand about the structure, and the thing that we still don't fully understand are the strength loss, there's no data in the literature showing a link um, between either of these uh, and strength loss. And no, in fact, the truth is that no one's ever tried to investigate that uh, directly. There are some indirect, some interesting correlations from the paper from which I've taken uh, this data, which, if you uh, interpret them that way, you could, could suggest that the strength loss that they measure is linked to actually both, potentially in terms of the temperatures and uh, times that they have annealed the fibres and then measured their strength. So it's an interesting avenue, a difficult one to study due to the, um, the way that it's very difficult to put a certain amount of excess enthalpy or birefringence into a fibre in a controlled manner, but potentially very interesting. Having said that though, following Griffith's theory of fracture growth material, maybe we shouldn't really be so worried about that because really it's all about the fibre Sur the surface of the fibre, the state of flaws, how big they are, their geometry. So, at least that's what we think. So, although all these other physical changes occur, perhaps that's not the most important thing. So, we should talk about that. Flaws on glass fibre surfaces are difficult. And um, believe me, I know, I've done enough SEM, and a lot of people have. And despite that, there's never been an image shown in any paper showing a critical surface flaw on a fibre before it has been fractured. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a, certainly a challenge. You could spend a long time looking for something like that. Sometimes it is possible to observe um, the origin of fracture and to look at the fractography of single fibres using SEM after you've uh, broken the samples. And here's an example. In this image, you kind of look to the centre here, you see there's a kind of semicircular, looks like a semicircular um, hole or flaw at the fracture, it is at the fracture origins, we see the kind of divergent lines of the hackle as this fracture um, progressed through the material. So sometimes you can see something that looks like a flaw, in this case it kind of matched the dimensions of the flaw and the theory um, with the strength of the fibre that was measured. But to be honest, most of the time that's not what you find, that's the exception rather than the rule. So in more systematic studies it's been shown that for the most part there will be nothing visible at the origin that looks like a candidate for this flaw that has initiated the failure. Um, so flaws, their growth or development due to temperature is something that is certainly still not fully understood, um, but of course they must be present to cause the failure. It's certainly an avenue which further work would be interesting. Finally, um, I talked at the beginning about this recycling idea. Um, you, can't do, you, you, you can't do much with fibres when they're so weak, they have no real value. 
you have to find a different um, avenue. You're certainly not going to put them in a composite material which will have any reasonable mechanical properties unless you can do something about that strength. So although we um, maybe don't understand the surface flaws, a lot, a lot of work, some work has been done to try and um, do something, removal of the flaws, some kind of etching, to see if that can produce a fibre which has then got uh, sufficient strength that you could make a mechanical composite from it. Um, if you etch it and, and treat it in a, um, a certain way. So two figures show here uh, two different possible avenues. The first one is something that's extremely unappealing, even just to do the experimental work using hydrofluoric acid. It lets glass, it lets anything. Um, well, not anything, but a lot of things. Um, and that's shown that, yes, you can take these fibres which have a fairly low strength, below one gigapascal, after heat treatment. Uh, you can etch the surface for a quite a short amount of time and you will increase the strength. Um, but it's not something that's ever going to become an industrial um, option given the, the, the hazards. Um, slightly less hazardous, although still a, a quite strong alkali in this case is sodium hydroxide. And some, a recent paper has shown that we take at the beginning here three types of e-glass from different manufacturers, one's carding 3B PPG, just different, um, so they'll have slightly different formulations but it's all under the umbrella of e-glass. Again, we heat treat these, the strength um, decreases significantly and but we can then use an etching process with the sodium hydroxide which then increases this strength quite significantly. And uh, the important thing here is we get above one and a half gigapascals, I'm sorry, it's an error in fact, I shouldn't say megapascals, I should say gigapascals in that um, axis there. So one and a half gigapascals is generally considered sufficient uh, for a chopped fibre product that you could make some kind of uh, some kind of reinforced thermoplastic for a semi-structural type of part. So I guess to summarise, um, again, glass fibre remains the most widely used of um, the fibre reinforcement materials, but recyclability is a significant challenge when it comes to thermal sets, which make up more than half. They consume more than half of glass fibre globally. Uh, due to this tensile strength loss, which happens at elevated temperature, the precise thermal based mechanism is still not fully understood. There's a few avenues of research to pursue, for, absolutely, in terms of maybe describing how flaws grow or develop. Um, but other physical changes at this point in, in fairly recent times have been uh, properly understood and, and outlined in the literature. For example, the relaxation of biofringence from the fibre drawing or of the excess enthalpy due to quenching. Mm. This being indicative of so a, a structural rearrangement. And also there's a Young's modulus increase, which is of interest. The ability to recover the fibre strength is, uh, has been shown, it's been proved in, as a concept, uh, using some of these materials to etch, despite the fact that we still don't fully understand the state of the surface necessarily. And it may be part of a possible route in the future uh, by which we could De uh, develop a kind of re um, recycling capability for these materials, which is going to become um, can only become more important as time goes on. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll answer them.